So, thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, a session rather difficult to decide there between social innovation and social entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the things that struck me most about the opening discussion uh, was this whole question around the blurring of languages and categories. And uh, when I met our panel, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, over breakfast, this was one of the issues that came up. So uh, I think there were a lot of issues that came up in that first session uh, that we'll follow up on, and we'll try to follow up on them in a very operational way, so really trying to get into the details here. So my name is Delia Methcon. Um, I'm the Managing Director of Global Rethink, um, and uh, I'm not going to describe what that is. I've decided I'll just uh, leave it in the room for now, but I'm chairing this, uh, this session and delighted to be here. Um, what we're looking at here is a phenomenon that is... Uh, is very complex and it struck me in the discussion this morning, we were talking about the withdrawal of the state and of the government from public services. And in some ways that is part of what is happening. Part of what is happening is the, the uh, fact that the state has never been involved in public services in some of the developing areas. But I think more importantly than that, we're really talking about finding innovative solutions to very difficult social problems. And it's the the uh, combination, the cross-sectoral combination of the different actors, their skills and competencies, and the unique opportunities that that brings uh, to, to finding new approaches uh, to dealing with social issues um, that is really the, the, the key defining factor of social innovation. So it's the partnership per se and the way of approaching uh, rather than the fact that it's public services that are being outsourced <coughs> in some different way. Now, um, what I would like to do here is ask in, in our panelists to look at what is going on, give us some examples of specific partnerships that are working, and then to really drill down to look at what is making the ones that are working work, but specifically also to ask, and I think that was an interesting discussion earlier on, where do these partnerships not work? What are their constraints? When is it not worth moving into a partnership, and when is it worth it? Because the last thing we want to be doing is pursuing partnerships for the sake of it. We're pursuing them for a reason. And I think that really drilling down into that can be the most valuable part of today. Um, let me introduce my panel to you. Um, we're coming from very, very different uh, spheres here. On my left, Carlos Primo Braga, uh, who we... Uh, heard with your, uh, your uh, question this morning, uh, Professor of International Political Economy at IMD and Director of the Evian Group. And he has been working also uh, very recently in the World Bank and will be looking at some of the partnerships that they were involved in in the ICT and water sectors. Um, in the middle, we have um, Barry Magarinos Rusha, who is the Vice President for Sustainability Partnerships at Firmenich, which is a company, how many people know Firmenich? Not very. They are the company behind the company that, that makes uh, uh, flavors and perfumes for things like washing powder and whatever else. Um, and therefore not, uh, not, not one of the uh, consumer companies that has an image to defend, so very interesting on the sustainability level. She was also, she's also the chair of the UN Global Compact in Switzerland and has been very active on both sides. Uh, of, the, of the fence that we're now trying to dismantle. So uh, I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say about that uh, dismantling process. And on the far left, we have uh, Michael First, who is the Corporate Responsibility Manager for Novartis um, and working uh, globally on, on uh, partnership programs with Novartis uh, in the healthcare area. Carlos, let me start with you. Um, we, Give me some examples of the kind of, of uh, initiatives and partnerships that you have seen, uh, mainly in the, in the World Bank, that you think are working. What, what is making them work? What is making them successful? Thank you very much. Is this on? Not sure. Can we hear you anyway? Yeah, yeah. fine. So I will just <laughs> maintain it here just <laughs> to pretend that it's working. Okay. But it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I think there is a red thread between the discussions that we had in the previous panel. We talked about torture, and I can tell you I feel exactly like this with these lights on my face here. 
but we also talked about uh, what is happening in terms of these partnerships. And one area that I think it has changed dramatically the potential, the scope for partnerships is exactly innovation. So we can be much more effective in terms, for instance, of targeting the poor and to being able to deliver services than was the case 20 years ago. In a country like Brazil, where I come from, nowadays it's much easier to identify who are the poor, to avoid corruption, because you have very complete databases that people have to register. Of course, this also creates dangers in terms of privacy, et cetera, as we heard before. So what I'm going to share with you are experiences in two sectors. One that I work directly, information technology. I helped create a program in the World Bank called InfoDev, and I was the manager for five years of InfoDev, the Information for Development program, that basically financed uh, internet, mobile technologies, et cetera, in the developing world. And the other one area that I think it's critical in terms of uh, development, which is water, sanitation, and uh, the problems that we have, let's say, in ensuring that the partnerships in this area really make a difference. So I'll give these two examples in two areas that are very different, focusing on the question of innovation, okay? And innovation, in my book at least, is something very broad. It's not uh, necessarily frontier technology. It's something that it's new in an environment, be it from the point of view of a, a product, be it from the point of view of a process. And I would argue that potential for partnerships has increased significantly over the last 10, 20 years for a very simple reason, comparative advantages. On one hand, the private sector definitely is the actor that it's better prepared to innovate, particularly at the frontier. But it's civil society, particularly the NGOs, that have the energy and to do and to experiment social innovation. Governments, multilateral organizations have an important role, be it in terms of financing, be it in terms of the regulatory environment. The problem with innovation, it's a little bit like the problem with marketing. You all have seen the saying, the guy who says, I know that 50% of my investment in advertisement is wasted. If I only knew which 50%, right? The same problem with innovation. Actually, you are making a bet. And this is why sometimes you go very wrong. So the basic message is expect the unexpected. I'm going to tell you two stories of projects that the World Bank was involved with. One was to bring uh, teleconferencing facilities to very poor regions in sub-Saharan Africa. One specific example, Uganda. It is, we are talking, the 1990s. So here you have satellite dish, and we worked with the government in Uganda to pilot these experiments. So of course, there were all the problems with respect to the didactic material, the, qual uh, the qualification of the teachers. We didn't have energy, so we used solar energy panels. But all of this was more or less expected. There was one thing, however, that nobody expected, the monkeys. The monkeys loved the satellite dish. So <laughs> they would come and take the satellite dish from their positioning, and this would screw up everything. So, one colleague had a brilliant idea. Let's put a cage on top of the satellite dish that does not interfere with the transmission and avoid the monkeys. The only problem is that the monks got very pissed. They would come into the cage and would piss into the satellite <laughs> dish. And then we had problem with corrosion and the whole experiment went down. This is just to say that uh, you have these problems when you introduce new technologies in any kind of environment, but particularly in developing country environments. Now, if I were to pose you the question, what area, okay, 
governments are more, let's say, committed, at least if you believe in their statements, in delivering access to technology, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa. Would you say it's water sanitation or information technology? Anybody who thought it's information technology is wrong. Every speech of a president, a prime minister, will have something on the MDGs, particularly on the importance of water and sanitation. So, if you believe in commitment of governments in this area, you would expect, nowadays, access to clean water to be much better than access to information technology. For instance, mobile telephony. Yet, if you look country after country, you have a multiple in terms of uh, levels of access on information technology than what you have in terms of access to clean water. Then you could say, well, it's because the regulatory environment for the provision of sanitation water is very difficult. Not true, actually. If you deal, anybody who is familiar with issues of interconnectivity in the telecom area are even more complex. So it's not a question of uh, potential commitment. It's not a question of regulatory capacity. It's really a question very simple. There is no free lunch. In the following sense, in the area of information technology, Prices with technology have come down. And even with, in the worst regulatory environments nowadays, you have price above cost. In the area of sanitation, you typically have price at best at operational cost. So there is no incentive for the provider either to expand the network or to really be innovative in these areas. So this is given by the technological frontier in these areas. Are things that can be done? And these just two examples to conclude. Exactly in the area of water. Probably many of you have heard about the experiment of the Westergaard Foundation. Are you familiar with uh, the famous life straw water uh, mechanism? So this is a, a company that has a uh, humanitarian entrepreneurship uh, angle that has been very proactive. Actually, the CEO, uh, Miko, has been uh, identified as the entrepreneur of the year. The life straw was, in 2005, uh, identified by publications like Time and Esquire as the major innovation. This is a, a straw that allows you basically uh, to drink water from any source, which costs around $30, so it's pretty expensive for people living below $1.25 per day. And yet, it has a life of something like three years. And in theory, it would make a major impact of bypassing, let's say, these problems in the delivery market access to clean water. Yet, here is the problem. How do you pay for this? So governments are willing to experiment. Multilateral organizations like the World Bank, regional development banks, focus much more on infrastructure. So you come to the point of how you pilot these things. You can get good results. But how you scale them up? So they came up with a very interesting idea, which was the following. OK, we'll give. The straws, and actually they developed also family, uh, let's say straws, it's, it's a, a much bigger one that can uh, operate at the household level. And we'll give this away. They gave around $30 million of these equipments in Kenya. And the way that we are going to finance this, we are going to argue that in reality we are saving uh, in terms of the use of uh, wood for boiling up water, since people will not need to do this, there will be carbon savings in terms of carbon emissions. And we're going to use the voluntary market to sell the credits, and in this way, we can pay for this. So, great idea, lots of innovation. 
the problem. The problem is whenever you give something like the straw, even if people have some, let's say, initial introduction to the technology, you have to stay with them, with the communities, in a much longer period to make them effectively used. So there is a very high proportion of the straws that are used for other things. You can imagine what, and in the end, are not being having the effect. And on top of that, you also have the problems. This is the voluntary side of the carbon market. So it's pretty much based on PR. It's not part of the clean development mechanism. So the certification of all of this is also something that always creates lots of questions. Will it be sustainable? Can it be scaled? So just to finalize, another completely different example, which is the so-called ASA, which is an umbrella uh, coalition of NGOs in Brazil, in the northeast of Brazil, an area which is affected by droughts, it's semi-arid. It's not a problem of lack of rain. Actually, the average is rains more in the northeast of Brazil than in Berlin, for instance. The problem is that the distribution is very unequal. So you have something of the order of magnitude of 8 million people in the rural areas that two-thirds of these people have to walk roughly uh, more than one hour per day to get access to water. So you can see the dramatic impact in terms of quality of life, possibilities of work. So what did they do? Here, together with organizations like FEBRABAND, a federation of banks in Brazil, so it's a philanthropic contribution, they created a mechanism through which the communities built aqueducts or cisterns to uh, accumulate rainwater in a way that involved the community. So the community also created a kind of cooperative. So they pay for the creation of the cistern. Part of it is financed by philanthropic contributions. And the results seem to be quite significant, exactly because of the partnership and the staying power that once you have ownership in the community of the innovation, in this case, it's a social innovation in the way that they finance masons to come to the communities to work with the families, and they have already distributed uh, something in the case of uh, Febraban alone, has contributed 15 million uh, reais, which is more or less 7.5 million dollars, and uh, overall there is a, a goal of building 400,000 of these cisterns that has already been achieved. So, just to compare two technologies, very different situations, one in which a disruptive technology, the private sector is leading, and then possibilities for cooperation have arisen that are, to a certain extent, difficult to predict where we are going, but that are having a major impact. And then a much more stable technology where the regulatory environment is very difficult, water, but where there are some interesting innovations. The impact varies a lot, in my view, according to the level of ownership of the communities involved in the process. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Just thank you. Before, before we move on to, to get some more examples, I'd just like to, to delve in a little bit there. To you're, you're, you're making the ownership by the community the key point, and this came up uh, earlier in the, the, the day. Um, how, what kind of partnership is necessary or is best or worked in these cases um, to get the community really involved? Because it's an easy thing to say, community involvement, but it's not an easy thing to do for some of the partners. So what made it work in that case? Well, in the case, in the case of uh, AZAD, uh, in Portuguese, is the uh, association for the sem semi-arid. Uh, they had a very elaborate process that it starts exactly in identifying 
civil society organizations, and here we are not talking Oxfam or anything like that, we are talking local organizations that engage with the families of the villages where they are acting in terms of training, and then also in making the families involved in the process of building the cisterns. So they take ownership because they put lots of effort, and there is a whole investment in education in terms of why building the cistern in a certain way with the given mm -hmm. technology, it's more effective than, for instance, just to buy a plastic cistern that they could not afford in any case, okay? So it's not an easy process. You have really to invest, and you have to have staying power in terms of these investments. FEBRABAN, the Federation of Banks in the case of Brazil, has invested, and uh, as I said, in this case is a philanthropic contribution, but what I'm trying to highlight is that the results are quite effective in the sense that people take this ownership if there is a proper program, not only of explaining why this is so important in terms of health, in terms of quality of life, but also engaging them in the process of putting together the solution, okay? okay. Thank you very much. Um, we'll get back to this uh, whole question of uh, engagements, and I think it comes up with the, the point that was made earlier also around uh, the, the arrogance and the involvement of the beneficiaries. But maybe, uh, Michael, I could bring you in to, to look at how these partnerships work from the business perspective. You're, you're um, in that sort of middle position uh, as a working on the partnerships for a company. Um, how do you think that the partnerships between civil society organizations and business can really uh, effectively uh, tackle social areas of social problems? Let me maybe illustrate this with a very practical <coughs> example um, that we have implemented in Novartis. And let me just start with a little story. Some time ago, I met a colleague that was involved in this project, which is called SMS for Life. It's part of our malaria initiative. And when she worked um, on this project in Tanzania, she went to a rural health facility. And suddenly, a mother came by with a girl on her arms. And it was obvious that the girl had high fever, so there was a high likelihood that the girl had malaria. The health worker in the health facility, he looked at the child, at the girl, and then he gave paracetamol to the mother. Paracetamol uh, is a molecule which is uh, um, lowering fever. Now, my colleague said, you know, why do you give paracetamol instead of an antimalarial? And then the healthcare worker said, because I'm out of stock of an antimalarial, so I give paracetamol so that the child can die quietly in the night. And you know, this is illustrative uh, for, I would say, quite a big portion uh, of our world's population. Two billion people uh, don't have adequate access to essential medicine. Carlos already pointed to the fact that um, many, many people are living below poverty line, uh, which is defined by $1.25 a day. Uh, when we look at healthcare delivery, we are confronted with the problem that a lot of medicine is not available in the rural facilities. Um, accessibility is also an issue. Uh, patients, if they uh, get sick, they have to travel huge distances, sometimes invest a whole day to find the next healthcare uh, facility. And if you keep in mind that they are very often getting uh, daily salaries, traveling a uh, whole day means that they lose their income of the day, which is pretty high economic impact if you think about the fact that they just earn $1.2 a day or something like this. Um, Health-seeking behavior is also an issue. So people typically don't seek treatments when they get sick. Um, there's also an issue with regards to a lack of qualified healthcare workers in these communities. Quality of care is an issue in so far that we are confronted with a lot of substandard medications and even counterfeits, um, which is, of course, a big burden for people because if they spend money into a medication and there's no active ingredient at all in the medication, it's a waste of money and not so, just uh, a bad social 
uh, social consequence because they don't get treated. Last but not least, affordability is of course also an issue. So what is the prices of the medications uh, the patients can buy in these uh, rural facilities if the public is not providing it for free? Why do I talk about it? I talk about it because I believe it shows you how complex healthcare delivery at the local, and, uh, at the local level is. Um, and now I want to illustrate a little bit how we try to tackle this specifically with a program in, in our malaria initiative. Just keep in mind still today approximately 700,000 to 1.2 uh, million people are, live, are dying because of malaria per year. Um, the biggest disease burden is on Africa and the biggest disease burden is also on children which means that uh, still every 60 second a child is dying because of a malaria infection. A lot has been done in the last years in, in the fight against malaria. A lot of donor money is given uh, into this field and from our side, you know, in 2012 alone we produced 100 million treatments of, of our anti-malarial drug. Since 2003, 600 millions and 100 million treatment, uh, 150 million treatments just of a specific, a specific dispersible formulation for children, which is sweet tasting and cherry flavored because classically anti-malarials are bitter tasting so children don't swallow it. So through a partnership with the um, Medicine for Malaria Venture, we developed uh, this, uh, this uh, dispersible formulation. However, although we have seen all these great efforts, we are confronted with the situation as the provider of the medication that when we go on the rural and the local level, we are confronted with stockouts. We see that people go to the health facility and the anti-malarial medication is not available. And, you know, from a healthcare provider, this is a pretty bad situation because you get a lot of emergency calls. Then you have to ramp up your manufacturing and your production, which is very costly, very expensive. And you have to load a 747 and bring the whole load to, to a country which is in need. This is not effective from a social perspective and it's not effective from an economic perspective. So we tried to get a better idea what the actual problem is in the country and what we, had, what we have identified in this anal analytical phase is that the problem is in the supply chain. Um, so we have seen that there's a lack of appropriate management of stocks throughout the whole supply chain most of it is done at the paper base, and you can imagine that this is not really efficient and not really working very well. And secondly, we have seen that there are reporting issues. So no one really knows what kind of stock level exists in what kind of health facility. And this is then, of course, also translating into a big problem in terms of forecasting demand, which is uh, a huge issue in terms of manufacturing the medications that are needed. <coughs> Now, obviously, from a healthcare company perspective, this is not the space where you see your core competence. We are not a supply chain uh, logistics company, and traditionally you would say um, delivery of healthcare is a responsibility of the government. But now you can complain about the situation and point <coughs> fingers and say someone has to do X, Y, and Z, but it doesn't help. So we brought together different stakeholders at the table and tried to develop a solution which is tackling this problem of lack of uh, stock management and lack of visibility within the supply chain. And here we partnered together with IBM uh, because they have great innovation capabilities and technology capabilities. Uh, we brought in a very bright group of students because we wanted to have fresh non-corporate thinking, um, really outside of the box thinking we brought in um, organizations like Rollback Malaria, Medicine for Malaria Ventures. Um, we worked with uh, NGOs such as PSI and local uh, NGOs, and also ICT companies such as Vodafone. And at the end of this collaboration, we have developed a solution which is exactly tackling the problems that I described before. So lack of management of stocks throughout the whole value chain and also lack of visibility and no reporting. And the system works in the following way. Once a week, typically on Thursday at 2 p.m., the health worker in the rural health facility gets an SMS. It's an SMS-based system because SMS is a very 
common uh, technology in, in Africa. Once a week, this health worker gets an SMS, which uh, tells him that he should report his stock levels that he has of the antimalarial drugs in the rural facility. If he doesn't do, he gets a reminder on Friday. If he does, he gets free airtime on his private cell phone. That's the carrot. That's the incentive so that he does it, which has led to a situation that we have reporting uh, statistics of approximately 95% on average, which is pretty cool. Um, then the data goes to a central system, and through the central system, the medical officer in the specific zonal area uh, has total overview on Monday over the stock levels in the health facilities, and he can report back to other parties that are involved so that they can send the needed amount of stock at the right point in time so that we can avoid stock out situations uh, in time. And this system, because we work with Google Maps, even works uh, real life so that the, 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 the central medical officer, he can see whether health clinic A is going direction to stock out, where, where um, the, the health facility B has enough stock so he can send from a nearby health facility to the out-of-stock facility in a very short period of time, the needed uh, medication. And that's an important uh, uh, dimension of the, of the solution because typically if you think about huge countries such as Tanzania where we piloted this program, uh, the transportation from the central warehouse, maybe at the airport, to the rural health facility needs a hell of a lot of time. You are, you're affected with a lot of environmental issues, you know, rainfalls, bad roads, etc. Et so sometimes it needs three months to refill. And then if you have these close relationships with, between the health facilities, that's, that's a, a huge help. Now, what are the results of this pilot? Stockout levels uh, in health facilities with um, one antimalarial treatment missing dropped from approximately 26% to uh, lower 1%, which is a huge improvement, as you can imagine. And facilities that were uh, lacking more than one antimalarial, they dropped from 76 to approximately 25%. And because this was such a huge, a huge success, we had the chance to implement this program across whole Tanzania, together with parties such as the SDC and the MMV, and again, also some local NGOs and the government of Tanzania, of course. And this success has raised a huge interest in other African countries. So we are using now this system in Kenya, in Cameroon and Ghana. And interestingly here, we bring in different uh, products into the portfolio because we started with malaria. But if you think about the solution that was developed, it's completely independent from the disease area. Mm -hmm. So in Kenya, we uh, look at rapid diagnostic tests and, and, and other products that can be included. And what we also heard is that other pharmaceutical companies have developed interest in that solution and want to use this for their African operations. Now, I think the success of this model is really based on the fact that we were working through a cross-sectorial collaboration with totally different partners that brought totally different competencies than we had as a pharmaceutical manufacturer into the game. And therefore, we were able to construct such a powerful and impactful solution. And you know, without this co-creation, I'm pretty sure that we would never be where we are today with SMS for Life. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a really good example of using lots of different uh, skills from different companies, from different organizations, uh, governments, and, and so on, um, in an area. But it, it raises a one question for me, and let me just put this on the table and get your first answer before we, we move on and go into that in more detail. Um, you're, you're saying that it, other pharmaceutical companies are now interested, and it, it's, it's very clear that it's, uh, it's independent. You could use it for all sorts of different uh, medicines, and indeed other products too. Um, but that changes then potentially the business motivation from Novartis's point of view. So I'd just like to understand very clearly from you, when you're looking at it as a business, how, how do you, you're in the middle, you're the one putting all this together, but how do you within the company explain the business value to Novartis of this? How, how do you talk about that? Particularly if you're then saying, actually it'd be really great, good to bring in our competitors. Yeah. Let me maybe start with the fact that the first thing was that we had to argue, or not argue, but 
the great thing our management was looking for that we have greater social impact. Therefore, they were looking for this specific solution because it doesn't make sense to manufacture uh, hundreds of millions of treatments and the patient cannot swallow it. It's a waste of resources. So this was the big motivation to do it. But then again, an economic rationale is also included here, and that's that we don't want to waste money and economic resources by producing stuff that cannot be used. And you know, emergency, call, emergency calls are terribly expensive. Now, we don't bring in other pharmaceutical companies. They have just an interest in this kind of solution. And they reach out to the ICT provider, which is running this ICT platform. So the business rationale is more on the side of the ICT company, which can sell such a solution to other companies that are interested in this specific model. So there's no real conflict uh, with us because we don't uh, bring in other parties in, into the game, other pharmaceutical companies. Okay, but, but just in, in general, so you, you have managed to have a social impact, clearly. That's something also you can measure, which is, is another interesting thing that we can talk about uh, later. But can you sell that within the company, or can you, can you keep that going, the commitment to do this kind of project with the fact that it has a social impact? H how do you make the link to your business? Do you need to make the link? Maybe you don't. Yes, I think we have to make the link. And again, the link is, for instance, no wasti uh, not wasting resources through unuseful manufacturing of products. That's very expensive. You know, a whole manufacturing line was just busy with producing these kind of medications. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put them in the trash bin. Because we have promised that the stock life of the medication when they are in the country are at least 18 months. So, you know, if you wait and wait and wait, and then, of course, you cannot send it to the countries, and then you have to put everything in the trash bin, which is an econ economic waste. Okay, so the other thing is, of course, we are talking about markets that are very, very sharply developing. So you can think about this such as having a footprint in a market segment in the base of the, uh, the pyramid, which is today not tapped from our side. So it's a market or business development perspective which is also attached. And a business person understands this kind of rational or argument okay. very, very easily. Thank you. Let, let me move on to you, uh, Barry. You've been, uh, you were working within the, the UN and now you're working within a, in a company um, and you've seen these uh, partnerships from both sides. Could you um, look at what, what you see as the biggest challenges in getting these off the ground, keeping them going? But also in what I've, we've just been talking about with Michael, how you go about making the rationale within both sides. So you've seen that on both sides, working with business on one side, working within these partnerships on the other side. All right. Thank you very much. And it's great to be here. Yeah, I, I think what I want to talk about is a little bit, um, you know, a partnership journey. Um, I started to work on partnership in 1997, 98. Uh, at that point, I was uh, a PhD student in the US, and I decided that my PhD dissertation would be looking at partnerships between the UN and multinational companies. So remember, 98, no global compact, um, very few partnerships, and I started to interview around 500, 600 UN people um, from UNCTAD, UNICEF, UNDP, you name it, looking at how they were thinking their collaboration with business. And it was quite interesting to see that um, at that point, the academic reaction to my project was, wait a second, this is not a, this is not a topic, it doesn't exist. There's no literature, you cannot do research on partnerships. So that was, you know, today, um, you know, we're looking at the wealth of knowledge around partnership is, is quite interesting. So learning a lot about you know, what was emerging in the UN at the time, I was working with the team who created the Global Compact and was starting to uh, basically engage with companies to understand what was required, how the business engagement to the UN should be designed. And then I joined, as you said, I joined the UN for seven years working for the UN System Staff College in, uh, in Italy. And my job was to facilitate learning and training for UN staff to work better with business. And we did that in around 20, 25 countries. And at that time, the Global Compact was alive. So basically, the whole idea was, it's great to have those 10 principles, but how business are going to engage 
with others to integrate the principles, what kind of projects they're gonna be working on. So at that point, starting to manage meetings, um, basically the, the format was three days with UN people, usually heads of agencies in those countries, one day with uh, the business only, and then one day together looking at possibility of, of partnering. And then the purest effect of that I mentioned over breakfast today was that at some point, for instance, the resident coordinator of UNDP started to have in the performance indicator how many partnerships they would sign every year. And so you started to have this, you know, almost partnership drive, and it was all about signing partnerships and not delivering partnerships. And I think in the discussion we had this morning, for me it's very important to be able to differentiate very clearly that partnership management is one thing, project management is another thing. And a partnership can have a lot of different projects under that relationship. And I think we don't spend enough time and attention into what does it mean, first of all, to be a partnership manager, to be a partnership broker, to, to help construct that relationship beyond the project management. And very often we spend a lot of time looking at how we deliver projects, but we don't spend enough time looking at how we deliver the relationship. And I think that that's certainly something that, uh, that is quite interesting. We don't develop enough skills. And I think that was quite interesting that the UN had this program at the time called Partners in Action that we were delivering in partnerships with the, the International Business Leaders Forum. And we were really developing skills for people to and tools. You know, do you need partnership agreements? To what extent a partnership agreement is different from a, a contract? What, what does it mean? Uh, do you need an external party to broker your partnership? You know, how do you look at communication? Do you communicate as a partnership or should a company, you know, go off with a press release and not maybe consult with the NGO they just partnered with? How do you do things together? You know, how do you measure shared benefits, shared resources? Even for the UN, the key was at that point really looking at partnerships as fundraising mechanisms. They were not partnerships at that time. They were really another way to mobilize money from business. And probably at that time, businesses were happy to just sign a check, put the lo UN logo next to a, a press release and put that on their website. And I think to see the evolution now, I would say since 2000 until now, 2013, we see much more sophistication into not just using partnerships as fundraising mechanism, but really as delivery mechanism, and even as my two colleagues mentioned, as platforms to innovate. Because in the end of the day, if you work alone in your sector, you will be much less innovative. That's for sure, I think it's this, can't remember the quote clearly, but this Einstein's quote saying, if you think the same, you're just gonna produce the same. To think differently, you have to work with other people. And to me, over the years, to see business people, NGO people, UN people, government people sitting together and, and working together was quite amazing. I mean, you see how, you know, they are blocked in their own codes. Go to a partnership meeting and start checking the dress code. It's fascinating. <laughs> you have NGO people trying to dress like business because they go to a business meeting. You have business people wearing jeans because I'm gonna feel more comfortable with these NGO guys. It, it's the old partnership language and culture is really fascinating. And it's how we start in the end of the day becoming you know, a little bit hybrid people uh, looking at that. Then I left the UN because I have to say it was a little bit frustrating, not enough resources and it's slow and I'm a very impatient person so I wanted to move to something else. And um, I joined the nutrition arm of the Gates Foundation called GAIN. And my job was um, where I had a, an amazing chair called Jean Idu, who was a, an activist in South Africa and was really there with this vision of saying, we need to bring business to nutrition. And believe it or not, the food industry was totally not talking to the nutrition world. On the contrary, they hate each other, there's no trust, you know, especially because of all the baby food issues and the, the code on breastfeeding and all of that, no trust. So my job was to create the Gain Business Alliance, which, which was an alliance of companies, food companies, beverage companies, um, vitamin companies, and others, uh, looking at how they could contribute to um, the improvement of the nutri nutrition status of people around the world. Fascinating seven years there. Um, 
but one thing I keep in mind, um, one of the best partnership I work on was between this organization and um, a leading food company in France that you will recognize. And we were working together on their um, social business in Bangladesh. And the job of, uh, again, at that point was to help them measure the nutrition impact of uh, the yogurt in Bangladesh. So basically, we ran a study looking at uh, giving yogurt to children in school with no vitamins, and yogurt fortified with vitamins, and no uh, yogurt at all, and, and working on that study. Very complex study, very expensive, lots of people involved. And uh, we have a, a gain board meeting in Bangladesh uh, one day on purpose to look at how we were engaging with business and how we were working on that nutrition program. I have colleagues who decided not to come to the field visit to look at this factory because, oh my God, this company also has baby food. And that's probably one of the most responsible company I know doing amazing work on social innovation, social business, you name it, working with people like Mohammed Yunus and others. So the trust element we mentioned this morning again, and this fear of I don't wanna be associated with somebody who's maybe doing something wrong, is what's pre really preventing innovation. Because I think being partnership people is about being able to take risks. And even in my job today working for, as, as you mentioned, a company that nobody knows, but most of you in the room use probably 10 of our products this morning, taking your shower, drinking orange juice, and the rest of it were kind of the intel of smell and taste in every <laughs> single product you can think about, which is absolutely fascinating in terms of the responsibility we have reaching out to so many consumers around the world, probably five billion a, a day. Um, what we, we worked on, on partnership, and it's fascinating because my position didn't exist in the company, and they created that position called partnership, sustainability partnership, vice president or whatever, and um, why they wanted to do that. And I think this is why you need partnerships. It's because partnership is about knowing what you don't know. And what they realized is that the sustainability program was doing a lot of great work, it's a family company with a lot of tradition in philanthropy. They had done great stuff. But then the idea was, my God, there's actually a lot of things we don't know. And if we really want to have an impact, we have to work with others. And the little story I will tell before I close um, is a partnership we have in Haiti. Um, our CEO came to me just the day after the earthquake saying, Barry, where should we give money? We, we have to do something for Haiti. And I said, well, you know what? I think we should not give money. Um, I was one, one month, two months in the company. I said, do we have a business in Haiti? He said, absolutely. We've been sourcing vetiver in Haiti for 30 years. Vetiver, for those of you who don't know, is a, a plant, uh, and we use the roots of the vetiver to make perfume, especially male fragrances. Around 30% of the male fragrances in the world have vetiver inside. And the best quality in the world is in Haiti. And what we were starting to watch in Haiti was that those farmers were basically, after the earthquake, leaving the, the rural environment to go to Port-au-Prince, the capital city, to get free food and free health services from the UN and other um, you know, agencies around the world and, you know, and movie stars being there. And they said, God, we should better leave and not stay here doing vetiver. And we realized that we had a major risk for our business, not to have access to this critical uh, ingredient that we need for, for perfume. So we thought we have to rethink you know, how we can reinforce this supply chain, create a, a livelihood for these people, uh, create a better uh, environment for them. And so we decided to work with the Swiss government, who just arrived in Haiti. Uh, you, you know the Swiss are famous for going after earthquake with the dogs and finding people and all of that. And at that point, the Swiss government didn't have a development program in, in Haiti. So they were just starting one. And by tradition, they do a lot of work with small farmers. So they liked our program. We started to work together. And today, we are looking together at a much broader partnership. And I think this is also my final message. This is not about one partner and another partner. In Haiti, we work with the Swiss government. We work with the local cell phone company on education. We work with the EPFL or EPFL, you, you guys will know the Swiss in the room, uh, the engineering school in Lausanne. 
We're going to be working on biomass and renewable energies because you need a lot of petrol to make essential <coughs> oils. So we're trying to move away from that. We work with a, um, an NGO that works on agroforestry to look at replanting trees in Haiti. So it's really about you know, almost a map of what is the problem you want to solve, what are the competencies you need to do it, and maybe as a company you become the broker of that or you take somebody else to do it. So for me it's really, you know, what I see today is certainly a sophistication since I started in 98. Partnerships are more complex, but still a lack of resources on you know, financing those partnerships, which is different than financing a project. I go back to that. Often we don't put enough resources on, on the partnership management. And building more skills on, and building more people will move sectors. Uh, as Bettina from Filias was mentioning this morning, people are moving sectors and I think it's a good thing. And you know, I, I move from the UN to Gates to business and I'm sure at some point I'm, I'm gonna move again. And maybe go back to academia and, and, and take time to reflect and, and, and take stock of what I've done over these years. But to me, the key is really about behavior. Do we have the partnership behavior and mindset or not? And that's often the obstacle. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think we uh, have a, a broad view there of uh, some examples of what's working, but also many of the, the big uh, questions. And the, the one that really is at the heart of all this is clearly trust, and I think that would be a good place for us to start. Um, maybe I can bring in from the floor, and if we sort of go through this in different, uh, in different topics, um, the issue of relationship and uh, of trust, sorry, and language seems to me to be one of the questions that we need to develop a language that really uh, reflects the new kind of partnership. I was uh, recently uh, interviewing somebody uh, at uh, Diageo, which is very, very active in partnerships in, in Africa. And uh, she told me some fabulous stories, and it was a great uh, discussion, and I put this into the piece that I was writing. Um, when I showed it to her, she said, no, no, you can't put it like that. And she changed it back into sort of corporate sustainability gobbledygook and I couldn't understand it anymore you know it no longer made any sense I would never quote it because it doesn't mean anything and the reason was was fear of course of, of saying something too concrete so I think this point about it being a risky venture partnership um, but about developing language that we feel comfortable with and about being comfortable with talking about the uh, the, the incentives and needs of each of the sides is really important um, what sort of language, and maybe we can start this up, I'll start with you and then please come in from the floor. What kind of language are you starting to develop to talk about these things? How do you talk about partnership yeah, within, an, either in measurement, in, in approaching the partnerships in the first place? What are you using? You know, I think when you say we, we have to develop a language, um, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, some people have done a lot of work. I mean, if I think about, um, you know, a, a program that was doesn't exist anymore at, at Cambridge University on, on uh, managing cross-sector partnerships, people call the Partnering Initiative, which is a, a program under the International Business Leaders Forum. They have developed almost a, a dictionary of words that, you know, you use in partnership management but basically words that business huge and, and, and NGOs are using another one. If you take the word consumers or customers, for an NGO it's a beneficiary, and we're talking about the same people. So it's really you know, making sure that you know, when, when you start that collaboration, you, you, you know what you're talking about in, in that sense. And I think it's, it's not just the language, it's the relationship to time it's, the, really, it's the, the style also. I mean, I remember at the time NGOs were, were often very pissed off of business people coming with 25 PowerPoint slides to explain something. And now it's the other way around. Businesses don't do PowerPoints anymore and NGOs do too many PowerPoints. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really how we, you know, how we accept also the difference and, and how then we, we find a common ground that should not be a lowest common denominator, but a common ground. Thank you. Can I bring uh, in any of you from the floor? Dan, you were making very interesting points about, uh, about language before. What kind of language are you trying to use when talking to businesses? Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, on the very last point, we had a very live and real 
uh, debate. We, we co-hosted a conference with the World Bank about three months ago on what the bank is doing in terms of involving beneficiaries in their work. So we had a big, long debate, as only uh, international civil servants and NGO types could have, about whether the conference should be about beneficiary feedback or not. Um, in the end, we talked about citizen voice, which is what works best for us, because at the end of the day, I mean, we're in, involved in you know, citizen participation or, or civic participation, and you know, for us, the most important and relevant unit there is the citizen and, and empowering the citizen, regardless of whether they are a allegedly a beneficiary or not of the, of the project or a customer or client or whatever else it is. Um, but I think it's, you know, there is, there is this strange convergence, which is, you know, part of what's exciting about this conversation, which is, you know, the, the distinction between client, consumer, beneficiary, citizen is starting to blur. And the more progressive organizations, whether they're businesses like the ones represented here or international organizations, get that. Um, we don't quite know how to talk about it mm. necessarily. Um, but we're all trying to grab at the same, same thing. Do you think, and this is really to uh, all of you, do you, do you think that um, part of what needs to happen is to be moving between the, the, the sexes we were talking about so that you have a better understanding? You now understand both sides of the, 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 the uh, field very well. Is that what is needed? Or is it also, is it a new language or is it learning the the separate languages of each of the different partners. Do each of the partners need to stay in their fields or do they need to really start to merge more in a, in a way? Yeah? Yeah, I just would like to mention something very quick on that. And, and I think, you know, very often we have a pessimistic view of the world that things don't change and, and, and whatever. And, and your point on the World Bank and also you were um, with, with the bank before. I wrote my master thesis in 94 on World Bank NGO partnerships. At that time, you had a little group of people in a very remote corner, you will remember them, called the World Bank NGO unit. And it was like an absolutely non-existing <laughs> office almost, and today you have this. So my point is, you know, like 20 years later, the, the change is happening. Mm. And and I think it would be it would be great to, to hear our colleague from IMD on that. I think the, the education partners the business schools have a role to play to create these new leaders. And the fact that, you know, now MBAs are integrating courses on sustainability, on CSR, that they have also uh, people coming to take MBAs coming from NGOs, that this cross thing is happening through education, mm -hmm. I think to me is quite important. Carlos, can we? Yeah, no, uh, two comments on this. First, uh, on the World Bank. Uh, it is an example that uh, also connects to the issue of leadership because in 1995, uh, Jim Wolfenson became the president and uh, he had, let's say, this view that uh, it had to be a much broader, let's say, conversation with civil society. So it really changed uh, the way that uh, we operated. I was in the bank at that time I was the principal economist in the telecom area and uh, was involved in the creation of InfoDev. And uh, we had many, many conversations with Wolf and so on at that point in time, how to use technology in this type of uh, conversation. Now, in the end, the question of common language, it's the question uh, like in any, let's say, cross-cultural marriage. Often people speak... Uh, different languages if they can communicate, but when they are really mad at one another, <laughs> they, they choose one language that they can really communicate, right? Uh, and it's not an easy process. Uh, just going back to Jim Wolfens, and I, I had an experience. Uh, we went, myself, him, and a colleague, to talk with Bill Gates about uh, an idea of creating a platform that later became the Global Development Gateway. And, uh, and uh, Wolfenson began the conversation to, uh, with Bill Gates saying, how would you like to help us digitize the CDF? Bill Gates had no clue what was the CDF. You probably have no clue. This was the comprehensive development framework that 
It's a language that only made sense in the context of the bank, yeah. okay? And uh, going back now to the second point about uh, how business schools are trying, let's say, to uh, increase the dialogue in these areas, yes, there is an effort. Uh, I, for instance, I'm very involved with uh, the interface between the private sector and the WTO. So when you bring uh, private sector people to the WTO, and I just did this last Friday, okay, and uh, I typically start my uh, conversation asking, uh, for you guys, this was a group, a program, which is called uh, Program of Executive Development, so our mid-career managers from many, many companies around the world. Uh, do you think that the WTO is important in terms of uh, global governance? And most of them say yes. And then I ask, do you think that the WTO is important for you as a company in terms of your day-to-day -day operations? Nobody raised their hand. So there is a disconnect. And immediately when the WTO colleagues come and make presentations, the language does not connect. So there is a problem, which is a problem not only between private sector, international organizations, civil society organizations. I think that we are improving, but there is an issue of finding the common language, not only when we are mad, but also to communicate in partnerships and to be able to innovate. Michael, can I bring you in? Do you want the microphone? What, what, do you find yourself to be a translator in your company? You know, sometimes I feel pretty schizophrenic because <laughs> Inside, you have to speak business language, and outside, you have to speak more the language of civil society. And, you know, there's a trend in corporate responsibility, sustainability, whatever, to come closer to business, which is finally right. But then you try to speak the language of business, which is, in principle, also okay, but you shouldn't dilute the social value within your communication, of course, and the social impact you want to create. But from a practical perspective, you know, I have given up the hope that classical corporate programs uh, to train managers on how to deal with NGOs or civil society does work, uh, do work. You know, typically you have the typical situation that um, a company such as ours, they have a management development program with Harvard Business School or IMD, and then at the very, very nice setting at the Lake of Geneva or in, 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 uh, in Cambridge, they get case studies on a CEO X has done a great thing with NGO Y and the impact was Z. The result is almost zero. The only thing that works, in my view, is if you bring senior managers into the situation. It's about action-based learning. Let them see how it looks like at the base of the pyramid. Let them see that it smells, that it's dirty, that it's ugly, that it's terrible and let them work on a solution that is relevant for them from a social perspective, but also from a business perspective. And you know, this is an eye-opening moment if you start looking into the real life situation of people that are confronted with the biggest societal issues and challenges. And then you start to understand how other parties are speaking about the problem, how they try to tackle it, how you can try to adapt your language and your solutions to the actual needs and the language of the other parties. By doing this in a classical classroom situation, forget it. It doesn't work. We have all tried it for a long time. It doesn't result in the right, in the right solution. And therefore, from a business school perspective, I would really love to see that business schools are also doing a lot of these action-based training activities and bring their MBA students at the base of the pyramid, as an example, and let them face the challenges that, are exist, that exist there. Because that's a life-changing moment, and it's a harsh moment, but you immediately want to do something against it. That's the experience we made in Novartis, and the programs we have established um, uh, around this topic were amazing. They were just amazing. People came back after four weeks, and they said, I, I want to do something about this, but I want to do something with my business skills I have. Because this, how I, this is the way I can make an impact on these kind of communities. 
So bring managers into the situation, let them feel how it is, let them feel how the situation looks like, and they will start working on the issue. Thank you. Yes, please. I think just to, to build on that, it brings to another level of partnership, in my view, is, is internal partnership within your own company. And I think for us in our positions as people, you know, driving sustainability programs or whatever, those programs will never make sense if you don't partner, in my case, with my colleagues in research, my colleagues in purchasing, my commercial colleagues. And the same, you know, I take them to those programs, or even now I have my finance group saying, well, we're going to have a finance award for the best finance people, and the award will be to come to one of the sustainability programs for two or three weeks. And, uh, you know, coming from my CFO, it's quite amazing. And to give you a little anecdote, you talked about it smells, which for fragrance companies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it resonates. Um, you know, we have um, absolutely, we have a base of the pyramid program in, in India working with an NGO doing... Um, you know, um, consumer inside working on olfactive preferences of consumers at the base of the pyramid. And I went there with one of our perfumer. And imagine a perfumer is a, you know, is a, is a little bit of a diva, of course. But uh, taking them to base of the pyramid, you know, places and, and in, uh, in, in Mumbai and other places, he learned something amazing that totally changed his life. Somebody told him, you know what? The stuff your company does is really amazing because smelling bad is a stigma of poverty. And if I want to get a job every day, which as you mentioned, poor people get jobs every day, I need a clean shirt and I need to smell good. And it's a matter of dignity. And it totally transformed the way as a company we look at our responsibility and how we can you know, improve lives. We don't have drugs. We know how to make things smell good or s not smell bad. And looking at that, we have another amazing partnership with the Gates Foundation looking at access to sanitation. Why people don't use toilets that they have actually is because they smell bad. Mm -hmm. And so our research people are working not on perfume in that case, but what we call malodor control. So bringing the innovation and the research into making you know, a, a social uh, progress for, for communities. So, I think you're right. When you bring them, they will give you ideas that you, you didn't even have. And, and it, it creates the innovation on the spot. Thank you. Um, yes, please, let's open up a little bit. I can hardly see you there. There's somebody over here. And then over here. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thank you very much. It's very inspiring what, uh, what you're all sharing today. Um, one of the comments that, that I... Uh, that I would like to bring to the table is that I think you finished off really well in the end saying that I think it comes to people feeling the essence of what it is that we're doing because we can't bring anyone, everyone of course from our companies to to see where, where it really hurts but, but we can bring somebody there and bring back that awareness and then um, make the stories in the company and make them feel what is it that we're actually doing because I, um, I work with top politicians, top executives, and top performers throughout the world, and one of the basic things is that I make, make them feel the essence of what, what their organizations are doing. For example, with a pharmaceutical company that are making f um, fertility um, improving products, whereas I'm talking to them, but what is it that you're really doing? And they continue to say the products and say, for me, you're optimizing the opportunity to create life. And suddenly the man in the production understands why he, is not, uh, why he has a responsibility of not breaking a box and then maybe um, changing that box instead of hiding that he made a, a damage to the box and then he would actually be rewarded for it. And, and why I bring this into the conversation between the, the NGOs and the businesses is that I think it's important to understand the essence of what it is that we're doing, but to understand, have the understanding between the two worlds, we have to, to, be, uh, to dare and allow ourselves to, to say this is what we need and this is what we ideally wish out of the situation. And then understand why is it we need those things, because we come from so different worlds, so we can say, yes, we need, a, uh, we need uh, our logo somewhere, or we need this and this and that, but why? Mm. 
because the, the money that we are coming in and we are financing these projects, we need our clients to buy more products for us to be able to provide more money for these projects or we need, um, we need to hire new people in uh, with different kinds of skills. So I think it's, it's bringing to the table what it is that we need and what we ideally wish to come out of it. No matter if I talk to politicians, um, um, topic sex, wh whatever um, industry they're from, I always say never ever come to the s table and, and say, I don't want, it's, we don't wish to g gain anything from this because everyone has an agenda. And if we didn't, we would all be dead. Um, the, the people who need to survive on a daily basis they need food, or they need to earn that one dollar that can give you that, that can give that rice. And it has been forbidden for so many years to say what it is that we need and what is our agenda. And we all have an agenda, luckily, because that's also the motivation and the drive for why we're doing it. And so, so I, I hope it makes a little bit sense because Thank I you. really yes. think it's coming back to the essence of why is it we're doing what we do. Yes, and I think that's also very important for this. This language, the ability to be able to exactly. say that, so that that yes. is what we want. The and then you can change hearts and minds, which yeah. is just in the background of the. Thank you. Is. Over, yes, the lady in red. Um, uh, I'm Isabel Braga, his wife, actually, <laughs> and uh, I, I I just want to go back to this issue of, you know, an area where I think this partnership and social innovation. Uh, is important, would be important to discuss. Um, and that involves this issue of common language and also when is it important to have separate languages for different uh, environments where you're working, okay? Um, this issue of, okay, there is a big pressure for accountability, you know, what each institution, organization is accountable for in terms of results. And there's also, uh, so that drives a lot of the language, I think. When you talk about beneficiary, uh, mm -hmm. you're talking about someone who is, you know, getting some benefit from your project or whatever action you're doing. And you can expand, so there is a, a, a pressure to expand this group of beneficiaries. But also, when you work in a partnership, uh, you, you know, each, each partner can count the same person as a beneficiary because you're contributing. And then when you're trying at the global level to account for a number of how many people benefit from certain actions, you're sometimes double counting, triple counting. And I think all that, uh, I've spent you know, countless hours in meetings. When I, I mean, I left the World Bank. I worked there for 15 years. I left in November on meetings just trying to define beneficiaries for a certain project because it affects a lot of your, you know, your bottom line. And I think it's, it's important that, uh, that we try to come to this common language, but also it's important to keep very you know, defined definitions of certain terms because it, it can really affect how you interact in this partnership. Um, and to understand the the motivations for having, you know, different terms for, and, and I think it's, sometimes we spend more time in these discussions than in actually trying to, to work out a solution for the, whatever person, beneficiary or not, you know, on the ground. And I think it's, that would be an area, I think, where this kind of forum could, be, could have like a, an impact in trying to, to help define these terms and when you use them and, uh, and also, how can we discuss, how can we, we focus on results without getting boggled down in, in this terminology? Thank you. you you've brought up a, a topic that, um, let me, I'll, I'll bring you in in a second, um, about measuring uh, the, the results and how we go about doing that and what that measurement does also for the way in which we define the projects, uh, which is something that I would like to us to all talk about it in a minute. Let me bring in some more questions, but that's just one of the things that I, I think, you know, how do we measure and what, what ways can we develop that, that form of measurement so that we don't just do things that are easy to measure? The microphone over here. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, another good conversation. Um, I, think I, don't think, I don't think it's just a, a question of language. I think there's also differing timescales 
there's differing expectations, there's differing understanding of resource needs and understanding of the problem trying to be solved. So there's a not, it would be interesting for the panel to discuss that. I think there's other issues in these partnerships that, that have to be weighed up in equal measure with language. Um, if I reflect, and it's a really interesting conversation because I'm reflecting on my own organization, as I'm thinking about why we have adopted so much more of the language of business than they've adopted ours. And I think it's, it's not, um, it's not unintentioned. I think it's, it's done specifically because we're trying to appeal to a question that we get all the time from companies, which is what is the business value? Why, I, why should I do this? What's the case? And so I have to speak to terms of business to make that case. Um, and in doing so, I then acculturate the business to understanding why my issues are actually theirs as well. And that's really a good exercise for us because it allows us to mature our understanding about how we communicate to completely different audiences about the issues we want to deal. Some of the biggest conservation benefits I've ever seen achieved in my organization have been when I haven't talked about eco-services and when I haven't talked about biodiversity or the environment. It's been when I've talked about economic growth and poverty alleviation and these issues. So you can get what you want if you're smart about the language you use. But if I walk into the Minister of Water or Treasury in Kenya and start talking about ecosystem services, I'll be outside in five minutes. But if I walk in and say, we've got solutions around poverty reduction, and, and livelihoods, then, he's, then we're having a conversation, right? So it's not, I think the question of language and conversation is an important one to realize that it's not an unconscious kind of mission creep or it's not some kind of selling out. It's a fundamental shift in how we get these partnerships to be more strategic and effective than just being ad hoc and kind of fluffy. Thank you, yes, please, let's. Talking about language, I think, the, the word solution is a common word uh, in a way because if you, if you talk to uh, the business and you listen to their needs and you say, okay, we can come and bring you solution, then they understand. Uh, if, if you talk to NGOs, you listen to their needs and then we say, okay, we can bring you solution. Then you start with a, a common ground uh, where both can un understand each other. But one thing that the language and the way you, uh, you or the dress code we, will never uh, come across um, is the capacity to listen and to put yourself in the other shoes. And this is the most important thing uh, in order to, to start the discussion and to start the collaboration. And um, this is about values also, <laughs> uh, open mindset. And then we can discuss about languages and the way uh, uh, business school train and so on and so forth. But really the key is whether you are able to listen to the need to say, okay, we might have a solution. And this is also how you start uh, to have trust. Mm. <coughs> right, yes. My Please make it a little bit more concrete and specific. You know, when I deal with managers uh, in our company, also in other companies, I wouldn't necessarily say that they have a bad mindset or that they don't care about social issues. The problem is their daily reality that they are pressured and pushed to deliver the numbers. So the question of language and the question of uh, embedding sustainability in the, corporate, uh, in the corporations is really a question about governance. Becomes the question of sustainability part of a scorecard of a manager, as an example. How do we develop careers in companies? You know, when someone engages um, in a project which creates maybe high social impact, but a little bit of lower uh, uh, business uh, uh, impact, a little lower margin, does he have the same chances in a company to get promoted to the next level as a guy which is just pushing the numbers? Uh, how is the bonus structured in an organization is a, is, is a question with regards to that. Is a person which is giving a lot of emphasis on sustainability topics and maybe how he managed the business, is this also relevant in a bonus calculation and the incentivization of a manager? These are very specific and concrete things where you can make this question of sustainability and partnership um, 
part of the life of a, of a manager. And if a company does this, then it becomes reality and real. If this doesn't happen, it stays semantics. I'm, I'm firmly convinced of that. And companies at the moment, I believe, are struggling with ways to articulate these kind of issues in a more meaningful and specific way in classical governance parameters, how we manage organizations. That's something we have to face, and that's something we have to work very strongly on. So if I speak with managers, they say, of course, I like the mission and the purpose of Novartis. It's caring and curing. But this doesn't necessarily mean that in my daily life, I have to deliver on this mission every day because I have to deliver sales figures as an example. And if this is not included in the scorecard of this manager, it will stay semantics again. That's something we have to tackle and really approach in the next few years, I believe, to make this more meaningful. You mentioned this in well, your, your speaking and see if you can make a connection between these two things. You were talking about um, discussions you were having about trying to measure the success of of these partnerships and the social impact you're having in a more complex way for the company and taking a bit more of a, a broad view around that. Um, is that part of the same discussion about putting um, this into the heart of the, the business? Can you talk a little bit about how you, I think how so. you talk about measurement? I, how I you think talk so. About measuring success? Um, you know, when you put something in a, in a scorecard, in a performance management system of a manager, it needs to be smart, you know, it needs to be measurable, it needs to be attainable, and all these kind of things that you typically look at. And if you're not able to articulate what the measurement point that someone needs to achieve actually is, there is, a, I, big, I would say, a big hesitance to put it into a scorecard of a manager. Now, there's an intrinsic problem in the healthcare sector when we talk about uh, social impact. and. Um, the problem here is who is actually delivering the social impact and the social outcome in a very complex situation. Is it just the intervention that is coming from swallowing the pill? So this would be our contribution. Or is it maybe that the patient uh, has a good diet or that the doctor is doing the right diagnosis? So the problem of attribution of the impact is a very difficult one. Um, and therefore, it's difficult to get concrete and specific measures that can then be incorporated in, into the scorecard. But this is just a problem, but I believe we, ha we, we are able to solve this problem. We have just to put a lot of thinking behind and then we can do it. And here it's maybe not about perfectionism, it's about developing the right proxies mm -hmm. that give us the right direction and then we can work towards uh, these kind of strategic or operational goals. But it needs a lot of thinking and I believe we have to invest in this. Thank you. Yes, please come on. Microphone? Where is the microphone? Yeah, I find this uh, discussion very interesting. I'm coming actually from a market, uh, from the carbon market, which is actually very quite experienced or has learned during the last 10 years to measure outcomes. And the market, the market which is still alive, the voluntary market, is now very much going into measurement of co benefits. And addressing exactly these kind of issues, yeah, what is, which intervention is actually really uh, delivering the result. And I'm happy to hear that um, uh, go, um, companies are really looking for these kind of output-based um, schemes. So I would be interested to hear a bit more on the scheme that you do, for example, in Africa. What kind of metrics are you um, looking? What is the outputs that you're monitoring over the next uh, three, four years of the project. And I think we are at the beginning of the journey uh, when we talk about outputs because this is very, very difficult. We are having a discussion what should be the criteria uh, that we need to measure in order to have a better feeling whether we are really doing the right things. Um, we are not where we should be, and therefore I said we are at the beginning of the journey. What we currently do is, for instance, in the project that I described, we are looking at parameters uh, such as stockout situations uh, in these kind of facilities. Uh, we are looking at how many people we train um, in, certain, in certain kind of intervention or programs we do. We look uh, how many patients we meet with our medications. Uh, we look at parameters such as how many healthcare workers uh, do we train? But to be honest, it's not a real output measure. 
And I think exactly therefore we have to be more specific and, and, and put our brains behind uh, to have more meaningful measures in this area. Um, in the environmental space, it's much more easier, uh, I believe. And if you look at our HSC, our Health, Safety and Environment Department, they, they are throwing measures around my head that I will never understand. They are very tangible in what they do. In the social space, in the health air arena, it's much more difficult. And, and one thing, again, um, uh, is really who is responsible for what, with, with, kind, with which kind of intervention, and what has this specific intervention delivered on the solution. It's very difficult to separate this out. Maybe that's also an interesting conversation between uh, different civil society organizations and business too. Carlos. Yeah, no, just to go back to the question of results that uh, several of you raised and the points that Michael just made with respect to attribution. That's where things get really complicated, right? So, and then it depends a lot on corporate governance, on leadership and what are the structure of incentives in each institution. And I would say it's not only corporations, it's international governmental organizations, you know, NGOs, etc. Because if you have this culture of results, uh, as was pointed out, you are going to overstretch your impact. And although I'm an optimist in the following sense, if there is one dimension of the process of globalization that I think it's going to be with us, driven by technology, for good or for worse, I think it's mainly for good, it's the question of transparency. And in this context, if you are making claims that are not correct, sooner or later, reality is going to catch up with you. But it's true that in the short term, things can go very wrong. Uh, the best example, we are talking about innovation and how innovation is good. At the same time, if you have innovation in a situation of poor regulatory environment and poor corporate governance, you get Lehman Brothers. Okay? So innovation can, obviously, is excellent. But you also can get a situation in which all the incentives are for short-term results. So the units are doing great, great results. And they are basically passing the externality to the system till a moment that the system collapses. So that's the problem. And when we go to results, there is this pressure, particularly where I used to sit, Dealing, I was the secretary of the development committee, uh, the organization that uh, oversees the development transfers for the World Bank and the IMF. So you basically are under lots of pressure from governments at this point in time exactly to put emphasis on results. Everybody is creating numbers because this is going to define what kind of aid allocation you're going to get. And you can get things very wrong. It's like the story of the cab driver and the priest that die in an accident, and when they come to the Pearl Gates, uh, St. Peter immediately sends the tax driver to heaven, and the priest goes to purgatory. And the priest says, I don't understand. I spent my whole life trying to advance the goals of faith and uh, welfare. And this guy, as far as I can tell, he was only a terrible driver. And St. Peter says, yes, but we are now on a results management. <laughs> uh, and he was such a bad driver that everybody who entered his cab immediately began to pray. We counted this, that's why he's in heaven. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I promised at the beginning of uh, this that we would also look at the question of where partnership does not work and why in so, some cases it really makes sense to focus on partnership as the, as the form of solution and where um, it is really not appropriate uh, so that we shouldn't just sort of expand it as a, as a panacea. Who wants to start off with that discussion? Which is maybe a, a difficult one to start off, but with maybe, you know, let, let's start maybe the way to get into it is to say, okay, partnerships take 
in enormous amount of time. Transaction costs are very high. If it's not scalable, it's very, very difficult. So where, where it, what sort of areas should we forget about partnership? I think to me, if I can start on that one, it's coming back to the discussion before. I think partnership will not work if you don't start from a need. I think if your objective is, you know, I need to have, let's say, WWF uh, logo next to my logo, and that's your starting point to have a partnership, this is not going to work. I think if, if the be beginning of partnerships are about, you know, uh, basically, uh, uh, public relations objectives and not uh, project objective. They don't. They don't work. And uh, and I would say it depends. I mean, we haven't defined, and maybe definitions are not very good sometimes. But we haven't defined really what is a partnership. And you know, there's a lot of different um, platforms, alliance, networks, other ways to talk about collaboration that sometimes are more <coughs> appropriated where you have more than two partners, where you have competitors together with NGOs. I think you know, platforms that are going beyond sometimes have more impact because they're really trying to solve a, a, a global issue. I mean, and, uh, and that can be if you look at um, you know, agriculture platforms now on, on cocoa sustainability or vanilla sustainability or you name it, where you know, competitors have, have also to come together with the suppliers, with, um, you know, maybe retailers, uh, with the whole supply chain. I think one-to-one -one partnerships sometimes are too small. And, and you go to, to go, you know, you, you used before a lot the word convergence. I think you need to go beyond partnerships sometimes. Thank you. You know, just to add, I believe Partnerships don't work, that's pretty obvious, if you don't follow the same strategic objective and if you're not able to align this into operational objectives at the respective side of the partners. Uh, the other thing that will not work is if you don't have complementary competencies or skills within the parties. You know, you can put your nose in the same direction between the parties, but you're not able to deliver on the goal that you have defined. It will not work. Another problem, I believe, is uh, scale asymmetry. Uh, if you're a global company, you have a tendency to look for global partners because you want to run a global operation. And if you run partnerships only at the local level, it becomes very expensive from a transactional cost perspective to start with a new partner in every new location, which is so burdensome and so expensive that you typically don't do this. So looking for a similar kind of size or at least growth perspective with your partner is also a very important thing, I believe, if you want to have a successful re uh, uh, relationship or cooperation with a partner. If these three things don't, uh, if they are not there, you will not have a successful relationship, I believe. Okay. I've, uh, we've got to close within uh, about two or three minutes. So as a summary, I think that the, uh, the most useful thing that we could do, because we've had a very broad-ranging discussion here, is for each of you to look at the, the one area that you think we need to work on most now to make sure that these partnerships are, are relevant to social issues and become a, a large part of the solution. Can I start with you, fellas? Sorry, that's... <laughs> well, that's a diff very difficult proposition, I mean, in one area. I would say I will go back to the question of when partnerships work or do not work. I would argue that the question of alignment of expectations, this has to be looked very carefully at the very beginning. Because typically there is a rush to get together and to uh, invest in the partnership without really having a common, it goes beyond common language, I fully agree, but a common understanding of where we want to get. And if you put together with this the fact that in the end what is really important for a partnership to work is to have the incentives well aligned so that even if uh, people uh, have different views of the future, there is nothing wrong. We can share the same bed and have different dreams. But you have at least to be aligned in terms of the project associate or projects associated with the partnership and the incentives in the partners be aligned in terms of uh, creating pressure for the partnership 
to be a value-added proposition for both parties. Often, there is a rush to create partnerships, and only after people really begin to think what is going to be the value-added. And as we all know, vision without implementation is hallucination. Often, partnerships suffer from hallucination. Thank you. Yeah, I would say for me, it, it, it will become more and more important to have on business side, um, the connection to partners should not always be like Michael and me, the nice sustainability people. I think it's important that partnerships are also driven maybe by you know somebody in research, maybe by somebody in, in, in another department. And, and I really wanna go back to that because it means you have embedded the partnership culture or the sustainability culture into uh, the different place in your organization. And, and to me, when you do that, it means with your partner, you build a stronger business case. And the business case means, in my view, that with the NGO or the UN agency or the government, you recognize you have a common goal. Most of the time, you do have a common goal, but you accept that you have that verging interest. My common goal in Haiti with the Swiss government is to improve the lives of the farmers, but I do that because I need vetiver. They do that because this is the way they have to invest taxpayer money in Switzerland to improve lives in a developing country. But let's accept that I'm here because I need Vetiver. And I'm not an NGO, I'm still a company. And I think companies should not start turning themselves into, into NGOs and, and really make sure we are okay to talk about our business case. Thank you. you know, next to what, uh, what was just said, I believe what is actually needed is to have a common goal. That's pretty clear for me, and then translate this in the right governance uh, of this partnership, otherwise it will not work. And governance then entails incentives uh, for managers, scorecard elements, career developments, and all these kind of things that, that we mentioned before. Thank you. Um, you you've uh, very nicely given me the, uh, the, the final summary. Common goals, diverging uh, interests acceptable. <coughs> But we need uh, to also have the, the governance, the structures, the institutions that, that allow that to be translated into something that can actually be operational. Thank you very much to the panel and to all of you uh, for a great discussion. And I hope that many of these uh, issues will be followed up on throughout the day, but also in discussions uh, among you. And uh, I look forward to the development of this next year, because as you say, one of the things we forget is how far this has already come, and therefore also how far it can go. Thank you very, very much. And the lunch is now out.